This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Avoid the Maze. And my guest today is another individual who I met through Podmatch.com. And Christian, I hope I don't mess up your last name. It's Christian De La Herta. Pretty close. Is De La Huerta. Okay. Well, you know what? I mess up everybody's name the first time, so <laughs> I apologize. No um, worries. But as I read over um, Christian's uh, bio, I was amazed with some of the things that he's accomplished in his life. Um, and many of us, sometimes we think, you know, it's never going to be us. We're never going to write that book. We're never going to pursue our dreams. Um, and I think sometimes it's because we let those old tapes play in our head of the things that we can't do when we really can. Um, so I know you've accomplished quite a bit, but what really excited me about your bio is that you mentioned being a man in the 21st century. And is it that much different than the 20th century? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, I guess the, what I, what I meant by that is that we we're living with very old, tired, and I think not sustainable definitions of what it, what it means to be a man. And I think it's, it's, time that we begin to revisit that. So let's look at a couple of numbers that I find interesting. Okay. Uh, longevity. In the U.S., women outlive men by five years. If you look at it globally, it's seven years. Rates of suicide. In the U.S., men commit suicide four times as frequently as, wow. as women. And in fact, 70% of the suicides in this country are committed by middle-aged white men, which is really interesting because that's the group that still holds the majority of the power right. in, in the culture, and I would even say in the world. And what's up with that? Because it sort of doesn't make sense. Well, one would think that the group that holds the majority of the power would have more benefits, would live longer, but it isn't, it isn't so. And I think it's because of what we started to talk about. We have these limited definitions of what it means to be a man, and it begins at a very young age. You know, little boys don't cry. And, and what's up with that? How come little boys don't get to cry? And because there's some pretty faulty assumptions about that, right? And so only little girls cry because what? Crying is weakness? Well, there are a couple, a couple of those faulty assumptions. Is like, first of all, that the feminine is weakness. It's like, wait a minute. If you want to talk about power, about resilience, courage. Let's talk about the, the, the power of creation that resides in the female body. And the other assumption that, that's, that I find just wrong is that the emotions mean weakness. It's like, who made that up? Somewhere along the way, the emotions are, are, are not strength. They're not weakness. They're not good. They're not bad. They're just energy. Like right. everything else in creation, what used to be spiritual teaching, that everything is energy, now we know. Now we know from quantum physics that everything is energy. And we also know that energy cannot be destroyed. So f for all of us, because we all do this, but men in particular, you know, we suppress our emotions. How many times have we stuffed our emotions and not said what we really felt because out of fear of conflict? or fear of rejection, or because we didn't want to rock the boat, to keep a semblance of peace, right? But the thing is that all those suppressed emotions don't just go away. You can't just sweep them under the rug. Right. So what happens is like we suppress, we suppress, we suppress. And then the next unfortunate one comes and says something to us the wrong way, and boom, volcanic eruption causing harm to our relationships. or. Suppress, 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 suppress. Those energies have to come out somehow, right? So what happens is they start showing up and seeping out as physical symptoms. They have an effect on the body, in our health. And so we end up with heart attacks, cancer, ulcers. And I think that's the part that's connected to the longevity issue. And so I feel we've got to, in the same way that this book that, that we're, you know, that, that I 
published recently about our relationship to power. So we got to get our relationship to power straight in that same way. We got to heal our relationship to our emotions and learn how to express them, how to communicate them responsibly. Because we don't want to go around like, you know, two year olds throwing tantrums and having right. meltdowns. So it means how do we learn how to, first of all, learn what we're feeling and discover, get in touch with what we're feeling and then communicate those responsibly, owning that there are emotions, taking responsibility for them. Um, and, and in a way, courageously, because that's always going to take courage to express stuff that could be awkward or, or, or lead to a difficult conversation and also compassionately in a way that the other person can, can hear it, not just pointing the finger and blaming them and attacking back or something. Um, so yeah, those, those are some of my thoughts of what it means to be a man. Well, so it's, you know, and I ahead. find it interesting because I just, um, completed a six week course and we're now going into six months of review of that six week course. And it was on personal intelligence. And until we get to know who we are ourselves and, you know, filter some of that information out so others can relate to us better, um, you know, it's, we're going to live in a difficult world. Um, I know for the first 50 of my 72 years, um, I believe that I had to make everybody happy because right. that was the lesson I learned as a little girl, you know, be sweet, be nice, you know, make sure that mama doesn't get mad because if mama doesn't get mad, then daddy won't be mad and everything will be perfect. And it's very difficult to be perfect. And even if you are making somebody else happy, you may be doing something that just doesn't feel good to you. That's and right. sometimes that's where that explosion comes out as well. It's like that's right. I'm being good. I'm being good, but now I'm going to be bad. Um, and this that's personal right. intelligence uh, course has taught me to, you know, wake up in the morning and um, think about how I want to be able to get through the day. You know, what is, what do I see ahead of me, you know, that could sabotage me, that could uh, just ruin my day. And if I know what that is, maybe I can approach it a little bit better, you know, and approaching it better might help my health, my relationships and my productivity. And I think that's what I'm hearing you saying about, mm -hmm. you know, we put these obligations on men and women uh, from an early age. And I agree, why can't a man cry? Of course he can cry. He's got the ability to. And when do we say that it's okay as a little boy, you're crying? Where is it marked in the sand that as soon as you become this age, you can't anymore? And yeah. that's that's yeah. how I saw my brothers being brought up. And um, it made no sense to me. Yeah, there's a there's a price to pay for that for sure. Because what what happens is we end up walking around like these uncaring, unfeeling robots, um, and there's a price to pay for that. And so what I did in that chapter of the book is is re revise, upgrade traditional roles that are associated with being a man, and apply them to like how how can we express these in a different way? So let's take for example. Uh, the provider, which is which is one of the ways that men have identified sure. culturally, right? We're the, the the man who goes to to the office and uh, and brings brings the paycheck, brings the bacon home. But but what's happening as women step more into their power? You know, these days, fifty more than fifty percent of college graduates are women, and as of a couple of years ago, in I think it's forty percent of heterosexual households the woman is making more than the man. So no wonder we have so many men in crisis of having an identity crisis. Like, who am I if I'm not, if I'm not the provider, if I, right. if I don't bring the paycheck home? Uh, but what a limited and limiting way of, of looking at what it means to be a man. Like, really? That's how we're going to define what a man is by the size of your paycheck? Um, and so what about different ways of providing like if if that, if that's your in, your identity, 
What about providing a safe environment, an environment of growth, of acceptance, uh, so that your family, your loved ones, your, your kids can, can s step on that rock that you are and explore what it means to be a human, what they want to do with their lives. That is, that is so much more beneficial than, than providing a paycheck. And, and not to put that down, of course, of course there's value in that. But it's a limited way, and so I'm just talking about how do we expand that definition of what it be, means to be a man. And, and Karen, I, lo I love what you shared, because you gave us like what, so, uh, what I would say most of us experience, which is how we became people pleasers, right? Because we, yep. we from, from a young age, we were so conditioned that our, our sense of worth depended on validation from parents. Right, so we so we be, began from a young age to to act as if, act in certain ways, to do certain things, to receive love, to receive validation, and to survive. But at what price, as well? Because the, we we that meant that we suppressed, in many cases, our authentic selves, our authentic expression. And 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 what you're pointing us to is like how many times have we said yes to be nice, to be accepted. Uh, to be loved, to be validated, to feel safe, when inside we really felt no, like it really wasn't okay with us. And how many times have we suppressed ourselves um, for that illusion of security or, or a false sense of acceptance? Well, and do you think sometimes we do suppress ourselves because we're afraid of the backlash, okay? If, um, you know, I was to tell you something very personal about myself, would you maybe look at me differently and say, well, hey, you know, I don't want to be on this podcast. Okay. That's what I think a lot of people are doing. They're, they're, they're pulling back because, you know, if I tell you what my religion is, or if I tell you what my political beliefs are, or if I tell you this or tell you that, you know, this so-called nice relationship could become fractured. That's right, and, absolutely. And that's and, what I mean by false sense of acceptance. Yeah. yeah. Be because and, I and think... How we stuff ourselves into smaller little packages for that illusion of security and for that pseudo acceptance. Because if I'm not presenting myself authentic, authentically, that acceptance is not real. Right. Right? They're, they're only accepting that illusion of myself that I'm putting forth. So it's, it's, it's a pseudo acceptance. Well, one of the things that really has become apparent to me, especially um, from the beginning of the pandemic, is that I become more intentional in listening to people and not judging. Mm. Doesn't mean I have to like what they have to say. I don't have to agree with what they have to say. But they have their opinion like I have mine. And I don't want somebody to put a muzzle on me so why mm -hmm. would I put a muzzle on somebody else? That's right. um, I saw something that somebody got on Facebook the other day. Um, somebody wrote and chewed out a friend of mine who is very vocal. And she'll say almost in every thing that she puts out there, these are my thoughts. This is how I feel. If you don't agree, don't read, go on. And this person instead just like, took it line by line and told her what she thought of her thoughts. And I thought to myself, why, <laughs> you know, number one, she doesn't even know the person. I mean, she knows her through Facebook does not never talk to her. She's never been in her presence. Okay. So these are her thoughts. Let her have her thoughts. If they're bothering you so much, go on to the next thing. And I'm wondering if we can ever get our society to do that, to become more peaceful, because we create oh our own individual wars. Oh my God, I carry in so much truth and wisdom in what you just said. Um, and, and that's why I spend the first probably quarter of the book speaking about what makes us do the things we do, like understanding the human mind, the, the ego mind, because that's that part of us that takes everything personally. And, and that judges, and that feels the need to defend, and feels the need to be right. Um, and, you know, I think, it's, I think it's the Course of Miracles, of, you know, one of those texts 
that's, that asks, would you rather be right or happy? Because you can't be both. Right. And, and so that need to be right um, and to defend our, our self-righteousness um, and what we think is the right way and what we think is the truth, um, it gets us into so much trouble. And, 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 and again, and, and, and it connects to this question about power. Like that's why we get stuck into these, in these power struggles. Well, and I, I see this happening um, with the youth of today, that they're, they're getting away from um, the power struggles. They're mm -hmm. doing what they want to do today. They don't know if it's going to be the same thing they're going to want to do tomorrow, but they want to live a contented life. And I work with some young people on the weekends um, when I do IT training. And what I hear from them is, I may love my parents, but I don't want the life that they have. Mm -hmm. And when I ask why, it's almost exactly what you're saying. They see that dad maybe ha has been struggling for a long, long time, um, trying to be the breadwinner, trying to be um, the person with the knowledge, because we always, you know, you read all these history books, everybody looked up to the dad or the men, not to the women. And these young people are saying the same thing. You know, my dad didn't want us to look up to him. Okay. He didn't think that he had anything that great to give us. And yet they feel badly that they may be drawn more to their mother. And my comment is, you know, talk to your dad about these things. You know, does dad know how you feel? Um, my son actually sat down with my husband one day and said, you know, st stop trying so hard. Just be you. And my mm -hmm. husband looked at me and said, well, I thought I was. He said, no, you're trying to get a better job. You're trying to make more money. You're trying to make sure that, you know, the light bulbs are, you know, not burned out. You're trying to do all these things, but you know what? You don't have to do it all. And my husband looked at him and he said, but my father did them. He said, okay, but if I become a father someday, I'm not going to do all these things. And my husband started to change. It was like, yeah, why am I coming home from work feeling miserable all the time? Exactly. Exactly. And, and what wisdom from from your son, from the younger generations? Absolutely. Because we and 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 we're just we we don't question why we do the things we do. We just do them because well, that's the way it's always been done, or that's the way my my our parents did them. But wait a minute, that's what conditioning is. Right? We we do things or believe things because. That's the way our parents did them and the way that their parents before that did them and be parents before that. And at some point, we've got to like get real and ask the hard questions um, and, and look at ourselves because that's where our happiness lies. And, and you know, we, and we all do that, men or women. Uh, we all get stuck into these limited roles of what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. Um, and this book on, on personal empowerment is for everybody because we all struggle. With, with these issues around power. We all say yes, when inside we really feel no. And we all stuff ourselves into smaller little nicer packages so as to not rock the boat too much. The book has a particular emphasis on women's empowerment. And let me tell you why. Okay. Um, I believe that when women are in 50% of power um, in the world, and we're not even close to that, um, we're going to have a very different relationship to war and poverty and hunger and social justice and distribution of wealth, how we treat the environment, to all of it. And, and it's not to put women up on a pedestal. Women also abuse power, I think, disproportionately or in more subtle ways that, than men do. Um, but it's because as a world, as a species, we've been running so off balance so off kilter between the balance between the masculine and the feminine energies that course through all of us. Because all of creation has that balance between right. the masculine and the feminine. We are the ones that make the feminine less than. We make it weakness. Um, and, you know, I hope this, I'm going to tell a joke that's credited to um, Betty White, and I hope it doesn't offend anybody. 
Um, but it really captures that. You know, apparently, she, the story goes that she was in one of those celebrity interviews. And somebody said something about having balls. And she said, wait a minute. Why, how do we get this association between courage and strength and power and balls? Because you thump those little things, and the guy collapses in pain, <laughs> bends over in sheer pain. You want to talk strength and courage and power? Let's talk vaginas. Those things take a pounding. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, yeah. she really was a very wise woman. And uh, oh my God. We, ne we need to think about some of the things that she said. Um, I guess in some ways I was lucky in my adulthood because um, I saw the strength that my mother actually had. Didn't see it when I was younger. Um, and I really, I really admired her for it because um, so many of the women of her generation, um, they were the stay at home moms, you know, and they wore, you know, dresses and pearls every day. And, uh, you know, they were June Cleaver on Leave it to Beaver. And uh, <laughs> right. I never really saw my mother that way because my mother was a working mom a good portion of my life. But her strength showed up in the last couple of years before my father passed away. And, um, you know, my, my mother started saying no to people when they would mm. either ask them to go out or ask my mother to do them a favor. My mother knew what she needed to do for her and my dad, but she knew what she needed to do for herself so she could be strong enough mm. to care for him as she knew was going to happen. And mm. she never said, why me? Or begged anybody to come help her. And she she did it out of love but she also did it because it was important to her and when my father passed away um despite her her grieving she grieved in a very nondescript way mm. because she knew that she had been strong enough to do what she had to do mm. and i admire that because um, I started changing myself. I'm not going to mm. say yes to everybody just to make you happy. Um, and if it makes me happy to do something nice for you, I'll do it. Okay. That's right. um, but I think but women it's, it's have the to come get... from, right? Is, is yeah. the reason why we do it, not because we're seeking approval or because we want to be seen as nice, but because it's it's in us to to be generous and to be exactly. kind and to want to do something. So it's so, and how do we know, right? So and it begins like also you were talking about earlier. How do we know? Like we, and it be, it begins with self awareness, because we can't do anything about what we can't see. And and so I love that story about your mom. What a what a beautiful, powerful woman. And I feel blessed too, Karen. I I relate to that because my mom. She had nine kids, and all of us within 12 years. And when we left Cuba, my dad was a psychiatrist, but you know, once we went, my mother was still eight months pregnant when we left, and we, and we the last kid was born in, in Spain, the oldest was 12, I was 10, and so when we hit the US, they had to hit the ground running, and my dad had to, had to work and feed all these kids and dress them and send them to school. And my mom was, like, she was the pillar of strength at home. And so I, I, I feel very lucky that I got to admire and, and be inspired by strength and, and strong and powerful women. And obviously you were living in a country initially that didn't see women as being strong and present, you know, before you came to the U.S. Um, and that had to have been difficult for your mom, especially if, you know, yeah. she had a different view of herself. You know, it's interesting that it's, that's not so, you know, there's some gray areas there because yeah, and, and there are in the Latino cultures, um, there is machismo for sure. Um, and, and, but, but women were respected, right? Like I see in other cultures where women do not have equal rights, but they're not honored, they're not respected, they're not seen, they're not seen as equal. 
um, whereas in the um, Hispanic, Latino, Latina cultures, um, it's interesting. There is machismo, um, but there's also the honoring of women. It, it's interesting because yeah. many of us have not seen that. Um, and that's why these conversations are important because we learn something that we may not have known before. It gives us a better way of communicating with each other uh, instead of making the assumptions that so many of us do. Uh, we see somebody walk into a room and if we think they don't look like us, then we automatically think they don't think like us. And if they don't look like us, they don't think like us, well, then we're not gonna have anything in common. And you're already building up a resentment inside yourself. Um, and you sometimes you can create this war inside of yourself. You know, I'm not going to talk to her because, you know, she's different. Right. But yet when you start having a conversation, you realize how many things we have in common. And oh my God, Karen. age isn't even a barrier. Well, it shouldn't be a barrier anymore. Um, even though there are segments of our communities that ageism is, you know, running rampant. And if you're over a certain age, you know, people think that you should be in a home for the old people and mm -hmm. what, what makes you old and what makes you young. Mm -hmm. And I know with my mom, she lived to be 96 and a half years old. She was excited about that half year. Wouldn't give it up any year <laughs> of her life. Um, and uh, up until she had her stroke, um, she was, she was living life and she was never afraid to tell you what she was thinking. Um, How beautiful is that? And, and, absolutely. And what a blessing to, to even from somebody from that generation, um, what a blessing to, to have had her as a mom and to absolutely. have somebody who had a sense of who she was and who had a sense of healthy boundaries and knew when to say yes and when to say no and what worked for her and what didn't work for her. It's like, wow, she was ahead of her, her time for she sure. Was. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide to write the book? Because, you know, I know you have all these thoughts and ideas, um, but did you think, were you writing it just to get those thoughts and ideas out for yourself? Or did you think, hey, if I write this, um, maybe I can help society a little bit? Well, it definitely came from that. Um, and I think it was inspired by two things. One, looking back on it, because I wasn't really conscious about this. But when my, you know, it was talking about my family and my, my older sister, uh, when we were kids, she was like a natural born leader. She bossed around not only the nine of us, but the entire neighborhood of like 15, 20 kids. And not in a negative bossy way, she would just say, hey, let's go do that. And we would all naturally go, yeah, okay, let's go do that. We would naturally followed until Karen, Karen, she hit puberty. And then I don't know what happened. I don't know if somebody said something to her that, that little girls didn't behave that way or whether she just picked it up through osmosis from society, but she turned that natural leadership off and she assumed this kind of um, saintly Mother Teresa persona. And I didn't quite, never really quite understood that. So flash forward, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, I was working with a literary agent in, in New York and I had submitted a proposal on a different theme, on a different book. And she said to me, well, I like it and I wanna work with you, but I wanna see some of these marketing ideas implemented, put into place before we pitch the idea to a publisher. It would have taken me a year to implement those ideas. And so it was like, you know, <laughs> screeching halt because I was already spending the advance in my head um, and then I thought it kind of sent me into a crisis in, in the sense of like, all right, if I'm going to write, I'm not going to write that book. And I even asked myself, if I'm going to, if I'm, if I'm not going to write for an advance, what would I really want to write about? And, and I just lived in that question for about three days. And then it suddenly hit me about a month before sitting in meditation for only the second time in my life, I actually had heard audible words, you know, like words that weren't, in, that, that weren't inside of my head. And the words were the soul of power. And I thought, huh, what an interesting idea. What an interesting concept. I don't even know what that means. 
but I got the URL and forgot about it. And so in the middle of those of of that questioning uh, period, three you know a month later, it it hit me like like a like you know one of those palm of the hand to the forehead kind of moments. And it was wow, if I do believe that the empowerment of women is the single most important thing that needs to happen in the world, then what am I doing about that specifically? And then I then it like put together like solar power women's empowerment huh like how do we do that in a different way how do we step into personal power in a way that's not about this patriarchal power over hierarchical my way or the highway this cowboy mentality that that, that depends power is, is expressed as, as a result of fear force control domination manipulation how do we do it in a different way that doesn't require that I push anybody down, step on them, put my knee to their neck in order for us to feel powerful? And that's where I began thinking about this whole conversation. Interesting. I love that. And, <laughs> you know, listening to you name all those different things, I'm thinking so many of us, when we think of power, we think of taking over something exactly and, and really what we have to do is take over ourselves you exactly. know we don't have to take over each other um bingo you know when the war in ukraine started i just remember sitting in front of the nightly news thinking why do we keep going to war why exactly. do we need one more something exactly and you know, I would watch night after night. In fact, my husband and I started watching News France because it seemed to be um, more truthful, I guess is the way I can put it. It didn't seem to be biased one way or the other. And so we started watching this so that we could get a, maybe a better grasp of what was going on on the other side of the world. And I thought, we keep doing this over and over again. We mm -hmm. all want just one more piece. And, you know, I sat there and I said to my husband one night, okay, so if Russia does get the country of Ukraine, what next? They're That's not going to end there. They're going to want one more and one more. And yet, why? And it's like, I see some of my friends who are saying, oh, I need a bigger house. I need an extra car. And it's like, why? What, what yeah. is it proving? Yeah, you just nailed it, Karen. Um, you nailed why we have this conflicted relationship to power because part of us wants it, but part of us is afraid of it. And, and it's because we've been conditioned to believe that power is a bad thing, that power is a negative thing. And you know, with quotes like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And who wants that? Who wants to be corrupted? But what they didn't tell us about that quote is that Lord Acton, who spoke them, who spoke those words, was speaking specifically about political power, not the personal power that you and I talk about. And then I think we, part of the conflict, too, is that we fear that if we really stepped into our power, if we really bead all of who we are, that other people wouldn't be able to hack it. And we'll be able to, to handle it and, and that we might end up rejected and alone and that we also fear that we might abuse it. And no wonder. Like all we got to do is turn on the news any given day to witness and to hear about or read about at least one abuse of power. Right. And so what happens when you put all that into a mix and you add to the mix what we were talking about earlier, that we've turned the emotions into weakness so that we hate conflict, we avoid confrontation, what happens is that we end up giving away our power, giving it away, selling out on it, our innate, inherent power that nobody can give to us, nobody can take away. We are the only ones who give it away. And right. the sad part is the, are, are the reasons for which we give it away. Like with the, the, what we were talking about earlier, we, we say yes when inside we feel no for that illusion of security, for that false sense of acceptance. And we settle for crumbs, morsels 
of pseudo love. And, and so it's not a good strategy. And so that's what this book is about. Like, how do we step into power in a different way? I love and, it. And, and, and so that is not power over, but power with. So how can our listeners find your book? Because um, I'm ordering it as soon as we get off of here, because, uh, you know, like I said, I've been a pleaser the majority of my life, and I'm working very hard at pleasing when it's healthy for me. And right. I think the book will, will help me. So the name of it and where can we find it? The name of it is Awakening the Soul of Power. And it's available wherever books are sold. Uh, so you can order it through your local bookstore or you can get it on Amazon. Um, and in terms of reaching me, uh, probably my website is the best way to do that. Okay. And it's soulfulpower.com. S-O-U-L-F-U-L power.com. And for your audience, Karen, anybody who goes to soulfulpower.com and gets on my email list, and it's not a lifetime commitment. We all know how easy it is to click unsubscribe if it doesn't work for you down the road. But anybody who does get on my email list will send them a sample chapter of the book that talks about what it means to live heroically in the 21st century. We'll send them some power practices so that the teachings don't stay at the level of information because we don't need more information. We've got information overload. What we need is transformation. And that only comes from really living, from really taking on uh, a set of teachings or, or, or practices or beliefs. And we'll also send them a, a guided meditation about trust, which I created and recorded like in the worst time of the, of the pandemic. And so it's like, how do we live, how do we move into trust? in the middle of you know, these times of chaos and uncertainty and fear. Wow. To our listeners, a lot of free information, but it's not just the information, it's absorbing it and putting it to use. And uh, Christian, I can't thank you enough. Um, we're going to have to have you back because you have a wealth of information that, um, you know, as I tell people, I started Avoid the Maze on this network of various podcasts we put together. And the reason for Avoid the Maze was, number one, I wanted to get healthier mentally and physically. Um, and I wanted to realize that we all go through issues every single day. Uh, nobody's life is perfect. Um, you can you know, read whatever you want on Facebook and see somebody, you know, frolicking in France or, um, you know, soaring in the sky and they say that their life is terrific and their life is terrific, but your life can be too. And I'm finding that little things can make my life terrific. Um, I live in the middle of the park system and all I have to do is go outside um, and see the greenery and walk wow. a little bit further and see animals and um, be in nature. Um, there's lots of things we can do. We don't have to necessarily fly across the rest of the world to see something that says, oh, I've made it. Let's make it right here and now. And uh, I love that. And I, I'm so grateful that you had me as a guest on the show. Um, sure, I'd love to be back and continue this conversation because you're so right. Like how many, how, what will it take for us to realize that it's not money, it isn't even power what's going to make us happy? How many more people do we need to see who have all the money, all the power in the world from the worldly definition of power, uh, not the spiritual or soulful power that, that I'm talking about in this book? And they're miserable. They're thin skin, and one tweet sends them into a tailspin. Yep. Um, and, and they have such poor self-esteem. Um, and rate of suicide, how many celebrities and multi-gazillionaires end up with addictions or, or taking their own life? So, so that's not, I think that's part of what you mean by avoiding right. getting stuck in this maze of illusion and, and finding within that maze who we are authentically, and that's where our happiness is. So thank you for having the show and, and your willingness to do that makes a difference in so many lives. Well, thank you again. And I will be in touch and we'll have you back again. Have Beautiful. a great day. Thank you, Karen.
Bye-bye now. Me too. Bye-bye.